why did I choose this topic? When I was asked to give a keynote speech here at the conference, and thank you for inviting me. Um, and I, I'm not here because we have to shovel snow in Germany. Um, in Germany, as a matter of fact, we, we didn't have winter. We didn't have one single snowflake. Really? No, no, no. This is. We're like yeah, we're lucky. like here. This is this is. It was very very mild. Um, so so I'm I'm glad to be here despite the fact that we have no snow. Um, so when I was asked to to give a talk on work that I. I've done in the you know in the current past. I was sitting down thinking, you know, what is it that most of my work has in common? What are the commonalities? Because um, I couldn't stand here and, and summarize all the projects of the past years in half hour because I'm working with different industrial partners. They all have different foci. I you know they're all very very different. So, but one of the things that most of my projects have in common is the feature of mobility. And so I chose this as a topic, and if I, if I was standing here, not as a university professor, but if, you know, somebody from industry, I would probably not limit this to current projects. I would probably go into e-commerce, e-business, you know, that's all the key words that buzz around when, when I talk about this. So. Let's look at this. Shopping. How do we, how do we go shopping? Well, there's a few women in this room, but men sometimes go shopping as well. So this is traditional shopping. You actually physically go out on the street. You physically go into the shops. But what you do these days looks like this. We have the mobility at home. We go shopping at home. Now, this is something very, very common. You know, we don't only do the physical. We we do the we're turn we're turning into e-shopping queens. And even when we do grocery shopping, you know, traditional grocery shopping, you go into the supermarkets, walk around. Even that is turning into e-shopping. We can even do our grocery shopping online now. And this is a movement, I mean, this is not, this is not very current. This, is, this has grown over the past years. And a lot of times we haven't even noticed that, how we're moving into this mobility and how that is creeping into our lives and in our, into our projects. So, mobility, the shopping carts go into our computer. That's just the introduction from the perspective of shopping. When we look at online shopping numbers in Germany, this is not, yeah, this is fairly recent. These are numbers from 2009. Germany has a population of about 82 million people. And when we look at this, and this is a study performed by Bitcom, the most favorite products that were bought online included tickets, flight and train tickets, followed by tickets, books, other bookings, clothing, accessories, etc. And if you, if you look at that, 24 million train tickets were bought via a mobile device. And that's a quite a high number considering we, we have 82 million people. So why? Why do stores offer this mobile device? And when I'm talking about stores now, of course that research and development that we do at universities, we orient ourselves towards industry. Of course we want to develop something that will potentially be of use. Now why would we want to develop or perform research on something that goes into the trash? And that's why we always have to keep an eye on economy and things that go out in the industrial world. So why do stores offer this mobile device? If we look at the 10 largest online shops in Germany, and I've limited this to Germany because I have those numbers available and I can actually confirm those because I'm, I'm working with some of these partners. Fairly recently in 2012, what we see is that this list is being led by Amazon. So about 5 billion euros, and that's about six and a half to seven billion dollars, were spent 
on Amazon or by you know, buying something via this web page. This is books in general online stores. So the next, the next area that's followed is the area of computers and electronics. So we have a couple of websites, notebooks, Billiger, Conrad, and Cyberport, followed by fashion wear. So these are the three main areas that went into the mobility market, into the mobility shopping, into the mobility commerce. If we look at numbers in the, in the United States, the mobile shopping, particularly on tablet PCs, and this is, this is a move that has fairly recently taken place, you know, about 10 years ago, it was still the smartphones and the tablet PCs are catching up at a very fast rate, is, a ha is having a very large impact on the e-commerce world. And you, if you look at these numbers, you can see that in 2013, here, in 2013, 15% of the online retail sales took place via mobile devices. Mobile devices, now speaking of smartphones and tablets, putting them into one category. And this went up from 11% in 2012, and statistics have it that by 2017, one-fourth of the um, online retail will take place, or the, or the retail will take place online, 25%. So these are high numbers, and the, these are numbers we can't just ignore. So what are the advantages? What are the advantages of this mobility, of mobility in, in products, mobility in projects? And I looked at you know, a couple of arguments that I found in research that did research on, on e-commerce and e-business. And I found a very interesting article by Jackie Perney. And she summarized it in the following way. She said, mobile application create unprecedented efficiency. It's very fast. You know, you don't have to go to your bank anymore. You just do this from home. You do this online. They foster instant connections. Wireless network, it's fast. It's very efficient. They allow personalized messages and rewards. This is the coupon system that a lot of people are attracted to. They, show co they showcase modernity. If, if you don't do this, if you don't offer an online mobile market, you're off the screen. You're not attractive anymore. You have to do this. It expands public pres pr presence. You have to do that. You have to have web pages. You have to be present online. Otherwise, people don't recognize you. And it, they also say it eliminates uninterested audiences. And this is interesting because they're saying we only want those who are actually interested in this mobile market. All the others we are, we're not even interested in anymore. So mobility is a, is a key feature in our lives. Why do people want this? I mean, we looked at the side from the market, from the industry. Well, people want this because they want to have means of comparing prices, of going shopping around the clock, it's very convenient, you can do this from home, it's stress-free, it saves time. And a lot of people even like the anonymity in this. You know, they just want to do this without you know, being noticed, without being recognized. So, to summarize this, there are a lot of reasons to go mobile. You now, both from all perspectives. So, we took all these aspects and all these pros and what does that mean for projects? I'm a professor of computer science, so I'm looking at CS IT projects. So what does mobility mean in IT projects? So if you look at the evolution of communication and especially mobile devices, this is how it started. This is how we got mobile. That's the first telephones. We don't have those anymore. The next ones looked like that. We don't have those anymore. Well, then we went into this, into this generation. Most of you will probably know, still know these mobile devices. You know, if you, if you want to call them mobile. 
I know all of them. Yeah. You know all of them? <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> okay. Now we're getting into the field where, you know, this is, this, these are the first true mobile devices because you had a station at home and you actually had a mobile device that you could walk around. All these were still hooked up to the walls. So these may still exist. Then the new generation, or the next generation, looked like this, big devices. You know, first, first generation of mobile phones, you couldn't put them in your pocket, you know, big, or you had to have big pockets. And this is where we are today. Large variety of mobile phones, you know, the market is very rich, not only in different companies that offer those, but within the companies you have very many different mobile phones that are being offered. So that's, that's the fact, that's, that's the world out there and we have to meet the needs of this market. And I thought it was very interesting to look at the development and how fast the development went. If we look back 30 years, that's when the first mobile phone came onto the market. You know, so all this happened over the past 30 years. First mobile phone was a Motorola Dynatec 800X. And I actually still remember having seen that. I haven't held it in my hand, but I, I still, I have seen those. Then a few, years, a few years later, phones got smaller, you know? A little smaller, but they still had, and I, I always thought that was funny, they had a little antennas that you had to pull out. Then, again, phones got smaller, and yet again, about five to ten years later, we had the first clamshell phones. But the first generation of real mobile phones, in the sense that we had a GPRS, we actually did have internet connection, was in 2000. You know, so that's, that's not that long ago, you know, 14 years ago. That was very slow internet, we would not accept that today anymore, and we had to pay for data transfer, you know, you have to pay for your bits and bytes, and, you know, it was, it was just running. It's like a gas station, da 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 So that's 14 years ago. It went on, and I'm, I'll go through this quickly, then we, we had the first phones early, early in this millennium with the first UMTS data transfer, internet got faster, then this, this phone actually, a lot of you will know this phone. This was the phone with the top selling numbers in 2004. 110 million phones were sold of this device. Only in, in 2006, the first touch, touch screen phone came on the market. And then there was a big revolution after that because that was the end of Motorola's you know, single market sales. That's when actually Apple came up with the first Apple iPhone, and then the market just spread, and from there on it was just booming. And we, had, we ended up with that big variety of mobile phones on the market. So, that's, so, so we're actually not looking back at, at decades and decades of development, but all this, and this is not new to you, but it really shows how fast we have to react to the market in our, in our products or our projects that we're, we're performing, we're running at, at universities. So, looking at this high diversity on the mobile market, um, I, was, I started looking at more numbers. I said, okay, we have the high diversity, but do we actually have the high numbers of people using these devices? So, living and working in Germany now, I was looking at Germany and the neighboring country, the Netherlands. So, I pulled out very recent numbers from 2013, and they say that 40% of all Germans, 14 years and older, they have a touchscreen mobile phone. Two thirds of all Germans aged 13 and younger own a touchscreen mobile phone. So two thirds. 70% of all mobile phones in Germany are smartphones, meaning you have internet connection, you do all your business um, mobile via the internet. More than 21 million Germans, so that's about 25%, use apps on their mobile device. And now I'm, I'm going into the development of, you know, computer scientists are the ones that develop these apps. 
So we're looking at serving 25% of the market in Germany if we go into this app development. And each smartphone user has about 23 apps installed. So people do use them. A lot of people have a lot more installed. 14% um, of the smartphone users, which is every seventh person, has more than 40 installed. And this is mostly the market of the, the age between 15 and 20. So now looking at a smaller country, the Netherlands, neighboring Germany, population of only 17 million, 17 and a half million, it's quite a shocking numbers. In Holland, they actually call toddlers, and toddlers are, you know, like your, your babies. You mentioned all the babies you had over the past couple of years. They call them screenagers. In screenagers. They have created a new term because 50% of three year old children, toddlers, play on a tablet PC, on a tablet device. And 33% of one year olds, one year olds, I mean, they just started walking, they play on tablet PCs. And I think this number is quite shocking, but that's reality. I'm not saying this is good, I'm just saying these are the numbers. So in 2012, 35% of Dutch households owned a tablet. And in 2014, this is jumping up to twice as many. So that's, that's the numbers, that's reality. The US market, and this is a study from 2012, says that 73 million people in the US of a population of 300 million were using smartphones. That, that's a high percentage. 21 million people in the US are, are using apps, smartphone apps. Of these 20, 21 million people, 70% have downloaded at least one app. And, three, and more than 300,000 apps have been created and released up to the date of the study. 300,000 apps, that's a large number of apps. And it's a market that's, you know, it's, it's hard to, to, to overlook that, you know. It, it's such a, such a high number. Um, smartphone apps have been downloaded nearly 11 billion times, and this number is expected to rise in the future years. So the numbers in the US are maybe not as crazy or shocking as they are for the Netherlands, but this is also, you know, these are all high numbers. Okay. So where do we stand at the end of 2013? 6% of the global population owned a tablet. 20% of the global population owned a PC. 22% of the global population owned a smartphone. In 2009, this number was 5%. So you see how fast that's jumping up. That's, I mean, this is just continuously growing. That's an increase of 1.3 billion smartphones in four years. High market. And of course, these people want apps. They don't, don't just buy a smartphone to own a smartphone. Maybe a small percentage does for reasons of you know, status symbol. But most of these people actually do use them for the reasons of mobility. So in average, there were two smartphones for every nine people on Earth, or 1.4 billion smartphones in you know, on, on this planet. Like I said earlier, tablets are showing faster adoption rates than smartphones took. It took them four years to reach 6% penetration. And tablets accomplished, for, for smartphones and tablets accomplished that in only two years. So these are the devices that we're looking at, tablets and mobile phones. Um, if you look at this chart, at this <clears throat> graphic, you can see that in mid-2012, right here, the global per capita rate of smartphone ownership beat that of personal computers. So we have more smartphones out there, and using the, we're actually using our smartphones as computers. Um, I would actually like to do a survey of people you know, at this conference to find out I mean, who actually brought his or her computer versus the smartphone. And I, I would guess it really matches these numbers. 
and the market is reacting. In two months, there's going to be a very big conference in Frankfurt, which is called Mobile Days. And this conference concentrates on five areas. It concentrates on mobile strategy, mobile commerce, mobile enterprise, mobile marketing, and mobile media. So and the, the slogan they're using is business is mobile. So when I look at the projects that I've run in the past couple of years, um, they beautifully fall into these categories. Mobility is not something that's limited to people like us, adults. You have it at all ages. This is a very common picture. This could be taken anywhere on the planet. You know, you have people, you know, they hold their mobile device up and they don't look at each other anymore. They just stare at their phone. Just landing here last night by plane, the first thing people do, I mean, right after touchdown, the wheels of the planes are still rolling, they're still hot. Boom, you know, phones are up. Um, very typical images, anywhere. Not just business people, any age. Youngsters, like I said, shocking numbers from Netherlands. You have apps like this, you know, Cookie Monster is, is talking to you, Sesame Street. You have people, young people, young, young children sitting in bed using a mobile phone. But also the other extreme. Mobile phones are not just limited to people who are in the active working process, also, those who have already retired, they're using them. And of course, the, the GUIs, the graphical user interfaces, will need a match. You have a larger display. You have less buttons to push. But in general, this is something that runs all across ages. Um, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. Who, are you monitoring uh, the time? So Margaret, you have, uh, let's see, I would say probably another uh, 12 minutes. Oh, that's cool. Minutes. That's very cool. Okay. Um, I would like to introduce you to actually to two projects that are very recent, but one of them I have talked about in this morning sessions in, in detail, so I'll, I'll see how deep I go into that. But I would like to, I have picked two projects which um, are, fairly, are fairly current and which fall under two of the categories from the list that I've listed um, for this mobile conference that's coming up in Germany. One is in the area of mobile strategy, the other one is in the area of mobile marketing. Um, with, in both projects, I'm working together with large industrial partners. You know, being, being a university or being an employee of a university our main goal is not product development. We do research, we develop prototypes, and if industry is interested, they can function as an investor. You know? But we, per se, we do not perform product development. But with these two projects, and the first one is a project that falls into the area of mobile learning, so maybe it goes a little bit into the direction of what, what you were just talking about for, for your research. Um, it's being performed with Lufthansa, Germany's largest airline. And the other one is a very recent project which, fall, which falls into the category of mobile marketing. It's a, the development of a mobile app for handicapped people, for wheelchair users. Um, and the partner in this one is um, Deutsche Bahn, which is the, well, it corresponds to Amtrak. In, in the US. It's, it's, I mean, so these are not miniature partners. These are big, big guys, big players. Um, so let's look at the Lufthansa project first. What would, what would we do here? Lufthansa, about three years ago, they approached me and said, we have so many managers and the whole management, we, actually it was management on high level management. It was, the number was about 2,000 managers. Um, they were all using smartphones. They were all using BlackBerry smartphones. And all managers in Lufthansa, they have to go through autodidactic training. They don't have time for actually physical training, sitting in classrooms and learning about new technology or new legal rules, something like that. They 
me to do this mobile because they travel a lot. So the goal was to develop a tool which will enable managers to learn about data privacy and data awareness, so, so a legal, legal um, content. We called our app Privacy Quiz, a privacy quiz. It was a game-based learning for multiple mobile platforms. Originally, it started out to be developed for BlackBerry devices because the management used exclusively BlackBerry devices. But we soon found out that um, we had to reach out and develop this cross-platform. So what did we do? Three departments of my university got together. The computer science department, I was the representative in that one. I got students and colleagues from the media department responsible for the design of the app. And I got colleagues from the business department who were responsible for the content. So the three departments, the three of us, we worked together. And of course, together with Lufthansa uh, representatives as well. And we developed our privacy quiz, an app that teaches you or teaches the management data privacy, data security, and data awareness issues. The first question was, how do we attract managers to this? I mean, managers, they don't have time. You know, a lot of them, they don't want to do it. They have to do this. So we had to motivate them. You know, they, this had to be fun. So we found that having to deal with a dry topic, you know, legal issues aren't usually on the top priority list for fun. Um, we, had to, we had to teach this topic differently. And we said, okay, mobility was a, key, was a key feature that Lufthansa required. And we said it also has to be easy, adventurous, and fun. So we were looking into the game field. So, but we had to be very careful. On one side, we had our Lufthansa managers. These are actually the CEOs of Lufthansa. But, you know, it's, it's very important to distinguish between serious and playful and childish and silly. Because if we had developed something that was childish and silly, this group would have said no. They would not have given us a chance. Actually, when we met these people, they usually gave us five to 10 minutes for demonstrations. That's all we had. That's what, that's what, that was the time we had to convince them that what we did was what they wanted to have. So we actually looked around and said, OK, what is there out on the market? We used something that was already known, known to many people. And we also had to use an idea that was easy to implement and that wouldn't or that would fill the screen the little miniature mobile screen so that it was it was not overloaded so after a while and also with you know, interacting with Lufthansa's management it burned down to who wants to be a millionaire this is something that's known worldwide it's a game, it's a show, it's a TV show that's very popular in Germany. It's a TV show that's known in the States. It's, it's internationally known. And if you think of, of this from a computer science and implementation perspective, this is not too hard because all, all quote unquote, you have is a question. You have four possible answers, one of them being correct. Now, no big deal. So that's what we did. We put this into the smartphone. And the smartphone screen looked like that, very easy. We had an, an introduction screen, uh, screen, quiz lounge, privacy lounge, with only four choices, a start, then continue, a glossary, and, and stop, finish. That was all, very easy. So no, no, no confusing screen, nothing, very, very easy and simple. So the way the quiz works, or the app works, is that you, know, you, get, you, you first get a, a, like a teaser. You get a list of facts, which says you know, it, it was primarily developed for the German managers. And so they get a, a fact screen. And the translation is here. Did you know that more than 35 
thousand blackberries are left behind in England's taxis every year. This corresponds to approximately 40 million emails which could contain confidential data about you or your company. When you read that number, ooh, you know, that's shocking. You don't want that. You know, you don't want that to ha happen because you get in trouble. So, after having attracted the managers to the app, they quickly go into the game. So the game starts, continues with the main menu. You can here either start a new game, you continue one that you have started before. You can look up certain vocabulary or terminology, or you can exit. This is very familiar from the TV game. You get the question, you get four different answers, and you either, this depends on the type of telephone you have, you either touch the answer that you think is correct by a touch screen, or you need to scroll down with your scroll button. Um, the levels of the questions are in complexity, they're rising, so we, we usually have three easy questions, like in the TV game. We've really copied the idea of the TV game because that, we didn't need lots of explanations behind it. You know, there was no big intro needed. People knew this. So this is, is growing complexity. So we have green, yellow, red, red being the very co complex. But people don't lose anything. You know, this is not a game where you can lose and you can, you know, and, and you can't win money. But the interesting thing is Lufthansa was so interested in this app and really wanted to make their management use this that they are offering okay. that they are offering um, items from their frequent miles program, like suitcases and you know whatnot, um, to managers who use the app a lot. So the more you use it, the higher you rank, and then you can actually win some of the suitcases. So um, there is a little there is a little attraction to that. If you did give the right answer, you get the green correct screen plus an explanation. It tells you, yes, this is correct because it gives you the explanation. If you type the wrong answer, again, you will also get an explanation, but the screen will be red. We also have a, what we call joker card. A joker card is a helper card. If you don't know the answer, you can choose to get help from the system. And we have implemented the 50-50 joker, which will eliminate two of the answers. So you know, then you only have a 50-50 uh, chance to get the wrong answer. But we also have included what we call the audience joker. And the, audience, the way the audience joker works is that we monitor the answers that all the users give. And on the basis of all these answers, of course, I mean, we don't have, these managers don't have an audience. They can't stand up while they travel and ask people on the plane, what would you say, you know? So um, we're, using, we're using answers that other managers have given, and on the basis of that, the possibility of, of answers are shown, and based on that, they can choose the answer that they think is correct. So really, we're copying the features from the, from the TV game into that. And um, of course, the questions and answers also have to go into the app. So how did we do that? How did the questions go into the smartphone? And um, what we did in parallel to developing the app, we developed an authoring tool which would enable Lufthansa's IT department to continue the development. Like I said, you know, we're not a development, we're not a company. We, we, develop a prototype and then we give this to the companies and they, you know, they do the rest with it. And so what we do is we translate the content into XML format. And this content, you know, that this is just textual content, gets translated into XML and that XML format is being pushed onto the server of Lufthansa and from the server it goes into the database of the smartphone, into the local, local database of the smartphone. So even when the managers are offline, they can play an online version, which, not, which may not be 100% current because maybe somebody has added new questions to the database, but 
you know, how long will they be up in the air? Not more than 15 hours or something. So by the, yeah, by, as soon as they have internet connection again, automatically the system will be, will be um, um, activated and, and, and if there's a change in content, it will automatically pu be pushed onto the, onto the smartphone. So this is the way the, the authoring tool looks like. And this is, this is done on a, on a PC or laptop. You have a very easy screen which says, OK, include a new question, include the possible answers, and mark the correct one. Exactly what you need for the screen of the smartphone. Um, we can have more than one developer in parallel work on this. We can have various authors at the same time. And they all connect up to the server. And all, all the information that these people develop through the authoring tools will be collected here at the server. And like I said, as, as, as long as or as soon as the user has internet access, it will be pushed onto, onto the local uh, database of the smartphone. So this is really the architecture behind it. You have the smartphone outside of the internet, sort of outside of the internet, um, but, or connected to the server via the internet. And this is Lufthansa's, Lufthansa's intranet world in the box. So mobility, mobility in this project is a big, a big feature. This, this project would not have been implemented if mobility hadn't been important. Mobility is really a key feature in this. And um, looking at, again, the uh, diversity of mobile phones, like I said, we, we did actually face that. Initially, like I said, it was developed for Blackberries. But we did, after, a year, after about a year into the project, we went into cross-platform development. And the app is now running on Blackberry, iPhone, and Android. So we, have, we are covering three different plat mobile platforms. And the app is, has been distributed among 2,000 managers. And they've been using it for the past two years. And we haven't heard much, meaning no news is good news. So you know we're in, co in constant contact with them. And they have new ideas. They actually have, new, have ideas for other types of content, not just um, data awareness and data privacy. Um, and what we're doing together with Lufthansa now, we're using the same, the same architecture and just including new content. So other departments within Lufthansa are using the same architecture now, um, covering the same you know, mobility um, aspects that we have covered with our initial app. So this is just one of the projects that I have developed over the past years. I would like to maybe use last minute or two for those who have not attended this morning's session. Um, jump into, let me jump into that, oh, into this project. Developing a mobile app together with Deutsche Bahn. And um, this started out as a student project where we developed a mobile navigation tool to compute barrier-free walkways. Barrier-free walkways for, especially for wheelchair users, but really for anybody who is mobility impaired. This could also be elderly people with walkers or something. You know. um, the motivation behind this was this. This is some, this is, these are pictures in Germany, but they could be anywhere on the planet. You know, this is something that um, wheelchair users face. Barriers, you know, areas that are blocked off for bicyclists are usually a no-go for wheelchair users. Entrances to train stations have stairs and no elevators or elevators that not, may not be working. Here we have surface, a surface that's, that's very hard to navigate across a wheelchair user, blocked uh, walkways, etc., etc. So this is very typical and this was our motivation to go into that. So what we have done is we have looked at navigation tools that are out on the market, um, all mobile, and oh, they're all known. You know, TomTom, Tom, Garmin, Google Maps, OpenStreetMap. 
And we have looked at not only the features that they offer, but our main criterion was to look for one that we can access. That we can access in the sense that they have open interfaces that we can hook up to. And so we decided on OpenStreetMap because OpenStreetMap would let us use their data. And we could actually add data to it. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel and add a new navigation system to the, to the list. Now, don't reinvent the wheel. So what we did is we looked at these tools. And all these tools, um, they offer a, com um, a computation of a route for people who want to navigate by car, by public transportation. Some of them offer them for pedestrians. Um, some offer them for bicyclists, but none of them offer them for handicapped people or wheelchair users. So <clears throat> that was the reason why we said, okay, we want to use our, or we want to develop um, a mobile app called Wheel Scout, especially for wheelchair people. And the features that are included in this app, and this app is a little bit more recent than the Lufthansa project. We've run this project now for a year. Next week, we're presenting at a big computer fair in Hanover, Germany, that Sabit. It. It's one of the largest um, computer fairs um, worldwide. Um, one of the, or the, the main features of Wheel Scout of this app, which distinguishes from like Google Maps or TomTom Tom or, or the navigation systems, is that barriers along a route will be shown. They will be demonstrate. They will. They will be. They will inform the user. We will compute a de detour if barriers are detected on the route that was chosen by the system. The app can be customized, so wheelchair users can actually tell the app, "Okay, I'm a wheelchair user of te of type ABC. You know, I can." I can handle, let's say, a boardwalk, or I can handle you know, stairs. Some wheelchair users can actually handle stairs. Um, but they may have problems with other kind of barriers. So a wheelchair user is not equal to a wheelchair user. They're all very individual. And this can be customized. We can include permanent as well as temporary barriers. Temporary barriers such as fallen trees, big mud puddles or, or ice patches or, you know, if you go up to Canada now, large amounts of snow. Um, and there's a high degree of interactivity which enhances the app continuously. The app lives by its users because the user actually has to include the barrier. And the way this looks like, and this is the final slide, I, I let you go, sort of go then, is, is this. This is a picture of a route from a starting point to a goal. Z is goal in German. So what the app was doing, or the app is doing, it's computing the shortest route first. It's looking for the shortest route. And this is based on what's called the Dijkstra algorithm. It's, a, it's an algorithm used in many optimization tools, computing the shortest distance between points. So here, the shortest route, which is this, includes red passages. So this means here in these areas, there are barriers which you can't surmount. This is something, according to your profile, you cannot handle. So what the, what the app is doing, it's computing a possible route. And again, this is up to the user then to decide whether he or she can can go that route, and you can see, and these are marked yellow, and you see this is, is a little bit longer. You know, you have, to, you have to detour this red area, and you have to detour this red area. And this is up to the user if he wants to choose the, 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 um, the yellow route, but also what the system is doing, it will compute the shortest possible route that contains no barriers, and this is marked green. So and you see this is, and usually that will be a little bit longer. You know? So this is the detour. But the user can be sure that along this route, there will be no barriers that will block his, his passage, his, his, you know, his route from, from A to B. We have tested this app um, in Darmstadt. My students went around Darmstadt, and they've included 
barriers, barriers of different types, you know, stairs, inclines, narrow passages. Um, and it's working well. Um, of course, you have to actively include the barriers. OpenStreetMap comes with a few barriers. It comes with some information, but definitely not enough information that would do all of this. It couldn't be doing the computation of alternative routes. Can't do that. So in order to use the app, anybody can use the app. You can use it worldwide. Wherever you have OpenStreetMap information, you can use it. And you know, is first step is to include the barriers, and then you can go. Then you can just choose a route, and it will do its little thing. Do the red, yellow, green, and, and off you go. So these are two projects in which mobility is, is a very, very important aspect. And if I look into the future of my projects and just like talking to people in industry who are interested in running projects with us, it's, it's growing. It seems like you know, that's exactly the direction we have to go into. And you know, most of the projects that we will do in the future will, will cover this aspect. Thank you.